But here, I want to tell you something about people who are called because hopefully it will help you begin to understand how God works. Because God doesn't work the way we all work. The first kind of person God calls, God calls failures. God calls failures. Come on, failures. <laughs> Exodus chapter 3 verse 11. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses understood very well he was a failure. I mean, this man at 40, with all the best education of the best universities of the world at that time, had tried his best to save Egypt and he had failed. Had to save Israel out of Egypt and he had failed. And he had been kicked out. And his life was wanted. And he had run away. And imagine running away from being up here top people in the world to becoming a shepherd. Now he was looking after. He had been looking after. Maybe he was even commanding a, a, a battalion of the army for Pharaoh. Now he was commanding a battalion of sheep. He was looking after sheep. And you know sheep are the most foolish things in the world. They look at you for everything. It's like uh, you can't tell them, quick march! <laughs> they look at you like, are you mad? They're just eating. And his whole life, wake up in the morning for 40 years and look after sheep. And Moses was even stammering by that time. And he says, Lord, who, who, who am I that I? The Bible says he stammered. And part of it, I believe, is just the whole sense of I'm a failure. I'm the wrong person, God. You can't use someone like me. And God says, rise up. Because you're the one I'm going to use to liberate my people. I'm going to use you to do something nobody else in this world has ever done. You're going to lead a million people out of slavery and you're going to form a new nation and give them laws. Ah, ah, ah. God, do you know who you're talking to? Remember how many times Moses said, hold on, hold on. I need to tell you who I am. I don't think, you're, I think it's a wrong number. <laughs> uh, I think you called the wrong, you wrote the, to the wrong person. There must be somebody else. Here. No, God is not. no, it is you I'm talking to. You failure. I'm going to use you to do my best work. Listen, God loves failures. If you feel like a failure, you failed in school, you failed in marriage, you failed in business, you failed in parenting, you failed in finding a job. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, you're the right person for God to use. Yeah. He's looking for someone just like you. Just like you. Because God has qualified you to be one of the called. Amen, somebody. So if you've been feeling being a failure is the thing that is stopping you from serving God, from today, understand, you are the best qualified candidate for God to use. Uh -uh. Somebody right now is being liberated. Yeah, you will never say again, God can't use somebody like me. He, you know some of you, you those times when they would put the grades in class and they would put that list. You never even started from the top. You would start from down here to see where your name is. Uh -uh. You are the right person. God looks for people like you. Why? Because the Lord says, in your weakness I am strong. You know, this guy up here might say, God chose me because of my grades. I qualified. I was called. God says, that's why I'm not calling that one. I'm calling this one. Because when I do my best work through this one, this one will never take the glory. And that's why you read at some point, it says, Moses was the most humble person on all earth. The meekest man in his generation. Why? Because he knew, it's not me. It is God. You are the best candidate. I hope you're understanding why you're the best candidate. Yeah, yeah. God likes people who will never take credit. Because they know. It is not me. That person who used to dance on the tables in bars, aha, you are the right person. Other people will look at you and wonder, what is this one doing in church? God will say, this one is the one I can use because they will never take credit. This other one who was in church their whole life will say, God chose me because I was so righteous. Yeah? God uses failures. Number two, God calls unworthy people. God calls unworthy people. Let me tell you, you'll be so surprised to know that the people who feel most unworthy, that is actually a big qualification for God to use them. Wow. It's something that actually unlocks the doors of ministry. John 1.27 says, Though his ministry follow, follows mine, this is uh, uh, John the Baptist, he says, I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the, the straps of his sandals. I mean, that's such a hump. Like the guy is like, I'm not worthy. I don't think he's saying it in a nice way. He actually understands who this is. And he's like, I'm not worthy. Like, why, why would he choose me? You know, when you think about it, John was the older cousin. So in most, most naturally, you'd expect him to say, this is my younger cousin, guys. I'm so happy to introduce this, my kid bro to you. 
But John understood, I am not worthy. This is the savior of the world. Do you guys understand who this is? And he says, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. And God says, that's why I need you. That's why you're the right person. I want people who are not worthy, who know they're not worthy. John 3.30, John, when his people came to say, by the way, Jesus is taking all your people. All our ministry we started, now Jesus has copied and he's even doing it better. He's baptizing people. I thought you were the Baptist. How are you allowing other people to take our brand? Jesus says, uh-uh. John says, uh-uh. He must become greater. I must become less. Oh my goodness, that is somebody who understands his role. That's what qualified John the Baptist because he felt unworthy. Come on somebody, if you've been feeling unworthy and you're saying God can't use me, I feel so inferior, I feel so unworthy, I'm just the last person. Maybe I feel unworthy because of my family background, my education background. Maybe I messed up in life, I'm so unworthy. Oh, you're the right person. You're the right person. You're the most qualified person in this room for God to use. Am I speaking to somebody by the way? Yeah, yeah. If it was me, I was God, I would have started in the temple and picked the most top Pharisee, Gamaliel. He'd have been my first disciple. If it was me. Do you understand? That's how humans think. Eh? Most qualified. The person who has taught, written the most volumes of, of theology. That, those are the ones I say, come follow me and I'll make you something. Uh-uh. Jesus doesn't look for those ones. He looks for the unworthy ones. Look at your neighbor. Do they look worthy? <laughs> okay, stop looking at them so strongly. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> God calls people who have been rejected. God calls people who have been rejected. You know, some people have been rejected in marriage. Some people are divorced. And somebody left them. Some people have been rejected by their parents. Some people have been fired from jobs. Some people have been rejected in the things that you tried and just kept not making it. Some people have been rejected by family members. It's interesting because, again, speaking about, um, <laughs> I was speaking about uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul. Paul was a very interesting guy because when he tried to become a, a Christian <laughs> and to preach, he was rejected. People didn't want him. To, he's like, you murderer, you're preaching to us. Like people actually rejected him. It must have hurt his feelings greatly. Uh, he was but the, the Christians were like, ah, about you. Later, he understood rejection. And he wrote later in First Corinthians 1 says, Brothers and sisters, think what you are when you are called. I think Paul knew when he was called what he was. And he says, Think of what you are. Called. He has to do better than anything anyone else. He says, Not many of you are wise by human standards. Not many are influential. Not many who have noble birth. And then he says, powerful thing. He says, But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah. Whatever they call you, that name, God chose you because of that name. Yeah, the foolish things. Aha, uh -huh, you're foolish. Come, 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 come. <laughs> I want to show the world my wisdom through foolish things. Paul says, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Have you ever been called weak? Good for nothing? Aha. Uh -huh. Perfect. You're the one I want to use. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Ah, I believe this is why the church must always be open, must be welcoming to people who've been rejected. Let me just say this. Being divorced does not disqualify you from serving God. It doesn't. In fact, there are people you will reach that other people will not be able to reach. Yeah, there's a ministry you have. Being cast off by your parents does not disqualify you from serving God. Your Heavenly Father will never cast you away. In fact, there's a pain. The pain you've been through in your life is what God will use. That mess in your life is what will become the message. And some of you, I want to speak right now and to say that there are people who you may be feeling so sorry for yourself, but as the Lord redeems you, there are people you'll be able to speak to that nobody else can speak to. Yesterday, I got a book from um, Pastor Jack, his son. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether he's here, um, but he, he gave me a book on mental illness. And he's not, by the way, there's another guy in this year's uh, summit, uh, Fearless, who's also writing a book on mental illness. And the, the, I love it because he's saying, 
I can write what nobody else can. You guys can write theory. Me, I can write my life. And I can help somebody that no pastor can ever help. Praise God. Uh -uh. The thing that the enemy was trying for your, to destroy you with is the thing that the Lord will use for the deliverance of many people. Yeah. Maybe you are raped. And it's always made you feel unworthy. Let me tell you something. In, that, in the ashes of that shame, the Lord brings glory. The Lord brings glory. Those things that you think are the ones that make you despised and lowly are the reason God qualifies you. Oh my goodness, you have a ministry that nobody else could ever have. Don't be ashamed about your past. God will redeem your past and make it a beautiful thing. Never let your past be the reason you're not serving God. In fact, you need to understand, there are things, there are someones you can preach that Pastor M can only guess at. But you have the experience to speak and other people will be changed. So praise God for people who've been rejected. Come on, let's appreciate all the people who've been rejected in the house. I'm, I'm, somebody is clapping right now. Listen, your rejection is your redirection. It's a reason why God is going to use you. I believe that this message, by the way, is building up people. God had told me this message is going to build people up and allow people to begin to walk out of this place very differently from how they came in. God calls people who are not believable. <laughs> people who are not believable that's the kind of people who God calls and let me tell you they have, this one I really identify with I had the biggest imposter syndrome when I became a pastor because I knew my past I, my past as an imposter <laughs> imposter poster <laughs> let me tell you it was such a tough thing for me because I kept thinking but I know my past there are people I knew who were much more saved in my view people who had been saved for long. I was actually, like Paul, a persecutor of Christians. In high school, I laughed at anybody who was a Christian. I, I used my intellect to tear down their arguments and make them sound foolish. And, and I was just the wrong person to be a pastor. Uh, God calls me. I mean, I played, in, I played rugby for uh, a rugby team. And those of you who played any rugby know how... I mean, the delight of rugby players was taking even gospel songs and turn them, turning them into filthy songs. Like it was just a mark of distinction to have a foul mouth. Um, we just were these guys who just did not care for anything. And then God decides, aha, uh -huh, you're the right one to become a pastor. So here I am leading, first of all, I started leading worship. And by the way, I started leading worship when I was still singing those songs on Saturday. So Saturday I'm singing the song, and then Sunday I'm leading worship. And of course, there was a dissonance. At some point, I was like, what? I'm a hypocrite. I can't sing songs. On... So I stopped singing the songs. So now I'd be just in the bus and people are singing the songs and I'm just like, I don't sing songs like this. God was slowly transforming me and just changing me. And then I slowly began to understand, hey, I cannot, these friends cannot be the ones who influence me. Remember, we talked about your friends. And I began to realize I must form friendships that will help me grow in my faith because my faith is the most important thing in my life. But I still kept these friends, but now these friends were giving me life so I could minister to these friends. But I still felt very unqualified. And some of you have heard me tell the story of the girl who I tried to minister to who burst out laughing. Um, she came to the office and she's completely stricken. She thought she wanted to see a pastor. I was an intern at Nairobi Chapel. I was assigned pastor of the day. So when I sat down next to her and we started having a conversation, I knew her immediately. She's one of the girls we used to go for those rugby games with. <laughs> we had a past. Oh, God. So I'm sitting next and I'm thinking, oh, wow, she's here. And I'm thinking she's talking to me because she knows me. But I realized she's now breaking down and sharing deep things. So I said, oh, wow. And I mentioned her, her name. I said, Ann, uh, you don't recognize me? First of all, when I said Anne, she looked up like, hey, prophet. <laughs> like, 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 how does this guy know my name? Is he about to tell me my address now in my email, you know? Like, 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 I said, you don't recognize me? And I, she said, she said, huh? Oh, oh, pastor, no, I don't. And I said, I am, and I mentioned the name they would have known me by. And the woman burst out laughing. She laughed and laughed and laughed. By the way, it was so hysterical. Like she was laughing uncontrollably. And then in the middle of laughing, she started crying. And then she cried 
and wait, like crying tears. And then I was like, Anna, are you okay? Then she, she stopped. She said, then she said, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm like, you do? <laughs> she said, if Jesus can save someone like you, even me, I can't be saved. <laughs> Some of you are not laughing at me. You're laughing with me. Yeah, if Jesus can save someone like you, huh? Pastor Sumit, if, so, if Jesus can save someone like you, Pastor Ray, huh? we're many of us in this church. <laughs> we're many of us. People just, uh, this one is a pastor, seriously. Yeah. People who are not believable. And I talked about the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was not believable. People knew his past. And there are some of you people will point out to your past. The devil will remind you of your past. You know that thing saying, when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Yeah, because you know where you are now. I'm not who I used to be. God has changed me. I'm a different person. When anyone is in Christ, they're a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. You know, people sometimes are so focused on what you used to be, they can't see what God has made you to be. They believe you can't change. They put you in a box. Ah, but God... <laughs> but Jesus and sometimes by the way those unbelievers are in your family the ones who know you the most are the ones who are like ah there's no way but guess what God is going to cause you to become a salvation bringer to your family yeah, yeah, yeah. it took a while but eventually I became that for my family and I believe it will happen for you in your family as well yeah, God will use you to bring the solutions to them God calls people who are not believe. So if you've been using that thing of, oh my goodness, I'm not believable, I'm the least credible person, nobody would ever believe, people would even laugh if they see me calling myself anything to do with a servant of God. Aha, uh -huh, you're the right person. Amen. I know one person who has said amen, at least they believe me. Uh -huh. You see, only one person believed me, not believable, I tell you this thing. Huh? <laughs> okay, two more. Number five, God calls people with an inferiority complex. Yeah, I love number five. Jeremiah chapter one, verse four to six. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. That's Jeremiah. He's like, Lord, I'm the wrong guy. Jeremiah 1, 4 to 6. I'm the wrong guy. I don't know how to speak. Like, why are you asking me? Ask someone who can speak. I'm too young. Wow, God, uh, you must be calling the wrong person. You know, many of us, and this is a thing that's very common in Africa, by the way. We have an inferiority complex. Many people have an inferiority complex. I'm too young. I don't know why. It's just a thing. It's that agency thing I was talking about. We feel robbed of our agency. It's like I'm too young. God can't use someone like me. Do you know the missionaries who brought the gospel here were in their 20s and some of them in their teens? And they didn't have ships or planes to bring them. They came on ships that would take weeks to get here. Sometimes six, seven weeks, months to get to this place. And many of them in their early, teen, in their early 20s, convicted by the gospel, college students. By the way, most of the mission movement in the 19th century was actually by college students. And many of these people went with such radical passion for Jesus that they packed their belongings in a coffin because they knew the chances of them returning were almost zero. Returning back alive. Ah, these were 20 year olds. Surely, who are you to say you're too young? But you see, we think we're too young. I'm too unqualified. I don't know theology. I'm still single. Come on, somebody. Any single people? Yeah. God, I'm so glad we have serious single guys and ladies who are pastors in this movement. Because it should remove the excuse of anybody to say I'm still single. I'm waiting until I'm found before I can find people. No. Don't get things wrong. Start serving God. All other things shall be added to you. Yeah, single pastors. Ma now, you, the, the, part, the partners you've been praying for are, are going to be added to you. Because you're seeking first the kingdom of God. Amen. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There is one who has received it. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, Moses, Moses said, Lord, forgive his Exodus 4.10. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you've spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. As in, I've never been eloquent in the past. And even since you started talking to me, I've not become eloquent. <laughs> what? 
talk about inferiority complex. But that's the person that God loves to use. Hey, listen, if you feel inferior, if you feel you're the wrong person, I just have news for you today. You're the best person for God to use. Yeah, God is looking for people like you to use. So never think your inferiority complex dismisses you. Moses served God even with that inferiority complex. In fact, God eventually got tired of his complaining and told him, Sawa, I'll get your brother to be your voice man, to, to speak for you. But you will still serve me. So you can imagine, I mean, it's like Moses had, he went now because he said, oh, I can't even speak. I've never been eloquent. God was like, ah, enough of that nonsense. I'm calling your brother who is eloquent. He will even be there as your mouthpiece. But you're still the one I'm going to use. Yeah, God has a purpose. He wants to use you in your inferiority, in your feeling that God can't use you. And then the last one, I really like this one. Number six, God calls people who have messed up. God calls people who have messed up. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 59. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Wow. Hey, Paul never forgot who he had been. He was a persecutor of the church. He tried to exterminate the very gospel he was preaching about. And he had really messed up. But you know, he never stopped. That never stopped him from being called. I mean, think about it. God was looking, and, and some people have actually argued, Paul, when, when you start the book of Acts, in the first two chapters, the disciples do an election. Because one of, the disciple, one of the disciples has fallen away, Judas. And they decide, let's do an election and figure out who will replace him. And they have two guys. Let me see any Bible scholars. What are the name of those two guys? Matthias. Barnabas. They do this... So, so the rest of you, Musome, please. Acts is coming soon. Just remember, these things, we read them. So you're supposed to read them so you remember them. So anyway, uh, they have this election, they have these two guys, and then eventually they decide, this is the one that we're picking to be the 12th apostle. Guess what? God has different plans. Because you never hear that name Matthias again. But a few chapters later, God looks for a very, 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 very messed up person the most messed up person in, all, in the whole region and decides this is the 12th apostle. There are many people who argue actually God's plan was Paul is the one who would become the replacer of Judas. Because from then on, in fact, the rest of the book of Acts is more about Paul than about the 11 combined. Like imagine Jesus picking up such a messed up person and then choosing this one is the one who's going to write over half the New Testament. I mean, Paul write, Peter writes two letters. The most, in, the most prominent apostle writes two letters. Paul writes over 13. I mean, what a, what a sense of humor God has. God is looking for people who've messed up. Maybe you've been here, you messed up big time. You're a Christian and you messed up in your faith. Maybe you messed up in your marriage. You messed up with your responsibilities. You're in a place where you've been hanging your head in shame ever since. But listen, God uses people who mess up. God uses people who mess up. People who've made huge mistakes in their life. You're the right person. Some of you, you, you feel ashamed when you think about how you've messed up, how you've made bad decisions in your past. And God is saying, you're the right person. I can still use you. I still want to use you. Wow. Is somebody feeling built up right now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Have I left anybody else out? I've, I hope I've covered all the, all the bases. Anybody who doesn't fit in there, then you're too qualified for God to use you. <laughs> you're, you're too overqualified God, you're, too, you're overqualified for this job why should you serve the Lord why should you serve the Lord and, and I'm so excited to see so many people serving the Lord in, this, in their generation in this church why should you serve the Lord I'm going to give you uh, just a few good reasons number one all things will be added to you all things <laughs> God said Matthew 6.33 seek first the kingdom of God and a few things will be added to you. Did he say that? No, he didn't say that. Seek first the kingdom of God and some things will be added to you. It doesn't say, what does it say? Seek first the kingdom of God and all things. All. God doesn't make random promises. God doesn't make promises he has no intention of keeping. He says all things will be added to you. I love that scripture. By the way, let me just tell you, this scripture is, it's one of my favorite scriptures. 
Because then I don't have to worry. All I need to do is seek first the kingdom. God says, will be added. Not, you will then add things to yourself after you've served me. He says, will be added to me. There's a great, there's a, let me give you a couple of really fun scriptures about two, two particular kings. One is King Uzziah, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 4 to 5. And by the way, these are some of those scriptures that are just fun to memorize because they're such good scriptures. They really help you stay focused. It says, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought, the, he sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. Like this guy, he was as long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. Like it was just almost, it was guaranteed. As he sought God, his kingship just succeeded. Another king is King Hezekiah. 2 Chronicles 31 verse 21. This one I really like, by the way. It says, In everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly, and so he prospered. You know, the words and so mean consequently. As a result, because he had sought the Lord, he prospered. Yeah. You cannot seek the Lord and not prosper. There's something wrong there. That picture doesn't add up. You know, Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and he rewards. I truly believe God exists and he rewards. Now, some of you grew up in homes where you saw people serve God and stay in poverty. And it really turned you away from Christianity. You saw pastors who really loved God, but, but somehow they just didn't seem to prosper. And so as a result, you're like, I, 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 getting too close to God might make me look broke. But then that's what I used to think. <laughs> Even you. <laughs> yeah, I used to think that. Kwanza, those of us who grew up first as kids. Yeah, they're here. PKs. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, I don't want to get too close. I might become poor. Are you poor, by the way, as you're serving God? This guy's a millionaire. Yeah. He is, by the way. I'm not even... I'm, he's serving God and God has prospered him. You know, when I began to understand that it's true, I, I think maybe there are principles that as you understand the whole counsel of God's word... You understand how to apply them. And you begin to understand that when God talks about serving him and he gives promises, his promises are activated by certain things. When I tithe, for example, God has promised to open the floodgates of heaven. It's a promise. It will happen. If you're a tither, God will open the floodgates of heaven. It is not even debatable. And I can tell you that from my experience. All the years I've known God, I've been a tither and God has actually opened the floodgates of heaven. Now, the only principle you need to understand, floodgates means rain. Rain on ground that has no crops means floods and washing away of topsoil. So floodgates won't help you if you have not planted anything. And the planting is the investment. God will bless your investment after you tithe. He will bless the investments you already have in the ground by opening up acceleration for them. You see, if you don't know that, ignorance won't save you. You will tithe, but you don't understand the principles of the kingdom. So, so, so I think you need to understand. This thing is, it's, it's understanding. It comes with understanding. Yes, I will serve God, but God expects me to do certain things for him to bless those things. Because the Bible says, God is the one who gives me the power to create wealth. So I can't fast 40 days sitting in my room waiting for wealth. I also have to understand how to invest so I can pray, Lord, bless my business. Lord, bless the work of my hands. Am I making sense for somebody? Yeah, but the Lord does prosper us. All these things are added. And I can say this, God has added to me things that are impossible. By human understanding, I don't understand them. I have a lot of ease. Those who know me well know that I walk in ease. I walk in ease financially. I will have wealth without sorrow. I hustle a lot less than most of my friends. In fact, the ones who don't hustle, the ones who hustle less than me are lazy because <laughs> I don't hustle, by the way. <laughs> yes, I work, but I don't hustle. And the work I put in the most is seeking God's kingdom. I'm a full-time pastor who doesn't have a job in Mavuno. I'm not paid by Mavuno, even though I'm a full-time pastor. My side hustles that pay me, I put in very little comparative to what I put into Mavuno. But by understanding, God has blessed those things to the place where they bless us. And I walk in ease. And I believe this is a portion God wants for every single one of us. 
wealth without sorrow as we serve him. Because the wealth of the world always has sorrow attached to it. God doesn't want you to, to squeeze your life. Try to bring wealth. To be so worn out at the end of it. That's not God's plan for you. God wants you to have ease. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have a good home. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be healthy. Not from striving, but from following. So that's the first thing. Why should you serve God? That all other things should be added to you. I believe, and I'll talk about this a bit later, that our life on earth is such a small dot. It's really, when you have perspective, you understand. You're just beginning to exist. You know, some people feel, man, I'm, I'm growing old. What a joke. Even if you're 80, you're so young in human years compared to what God created you for because you're created for eternity. You're in the infancy of your existence. Yeah? And this time on earth, it's a time that will be, it's, it's a very small time. It's a very small, short time that we're here on earth. And in this short time, God has given us certain promises that when we activate, we'll always look back and you realize, I lived this world well. If you are to go back right now, if the, the, the you that exists, the 30-year-old you, the, the whatever old you, was to go back to high school, in a high school body, but with a mind you have, would you struggle? <laughs> Things would be so easy for you. Isn't it? You'd know how to read. You'd know which kinds of people to avoid. You'd know how to survive even to be smart enough to survive the bullies. There are things you'd understand that a little child could not understand. And life would be so easy for you if you could go back 30, 20 years in your life with the same brain you have. In fact, you'd become very rich. Am I lying? Yeah. If you're in Kenya, by the way, and you went back to 2000, the first thing you do is just take, look for money, borrow, beg, steal, and, and buy Kenyan shares. And Safari Com shares. Then you just relax. And make, you'd have made enough money to last the rest of your life. Pay back your loan and relax. Why? Because you know things now that you didn't know then. Uh -uh. This word of God, it is those things. It is giving you that advantage over people around you. I know things that people don't know. So I sit down with my friends who sometimes you find somebody works so long and so hard and they're so stressed and they're barely keeping up with you wealth-wise. But you're looking at them and thinking, I wish you had the leakage. This thing, seek first the kingdom of God, it sounds spiritual and religious to you. It actually is not. <laughs> okay, someone's going to get this. Yeah, yeah. All things, tell your neighbor, all things, not, not some things. All things will be added to you. Yeah. Number two, you will experience divine protection. You will experience divine protection. You know, Psalm 143 verse 12 says, In your unfailing love, silence my enemies, destroy my foes, for I am your servant. Come on, somebody. David says, "Destroy, Silence my enemies and destroy my foes. Why? Because I am your servant. He understands he has the right now to ask for protection. Yeah. If someone works for you, and there's problems, they can call you. Isn't it? I remember the time my, I have a farm and some people were trying to, to, to steal some things. You know what my worker did? He hid in the house and he called me. <laughs> I mean, why should he risk his life and it's not his farm? Isn't it? So the man just called and said, Hey, Pasi, Kunawato, there are people. They are Nikubaya. They're here. Can you come? And then he said, me, I'm waiting. And he hung up. <laughs> He's like, let the owner come and defend his things. Isn't it? Yeah. When you seek first God's kingdom, when you serve God as a servant of God, guess what? Your life becomes his things. You're like, let the true owner defend his things. I cannot die here trying to defend what doesn't belong to me. God's business. My business becomes God's business. Exodus chapter 30, 23 verse 25. I'm just going to throw scriptures at you. You must serve only God your God. If you do, I will bless you with food and water and I will protect you from illness. There will be no miscarriages or infertility in your land and I will give you long, full lives. By the way, do you understand the scriptures were written for us? Yeah. These were not just things being said randomly. 
you need to be able to acclaim that promise and say, this is my promise. God, I am serving you. And you've said this in your word. Why am I experiencing these things? This is what you do. You stand in the, uh, in, in the, in the divine promise. So you'll experience divine protection because God protects what is his. And those of you who know me well know that I don't, I never fight to defend my property. I never worry about my property. So when the guy called me, I said, ah, Nikubaya, people are taking your things. I said, ah, ah, God, Nikubaya. People are taking your things. <laughs> I believe everything I have, by the way, even my clothes are his. So for me, because everything, everything I own, everything I have belongs to God, I never defend it. If you come to strip it from me, I will be the first one to tell you take it. Yeah, because it doesn't belong to me. He can defend his. If you come and steal my phone, I'll say, okay, fine. First of all, I'll be very sorry for you. <laughs> because I'll say, the one who defends these things, what? why would you call these things down on your family and your bloodline? But the second thing, I'll say, maybe God wanted to upgrade me and get me a new phone. Maybe he knew it was time. Yeah, I don't lose a beat worrying about things of mine because I don't own them. They have an owner. Let me tell you, you will have such divine protection, you will walk in ease and no fear. If I lose it, it belongs to him. Yeah, I don't have anything. I, some of you are so worried about the things you could lose and you live in fear and this is a solution. Seek first, serve him. Number three, you will experience divine fulfillment. You'll experience divine fulfillment. What did we say? Your labor in the Lord? Mm -mm -mm. By the way, tomorrow we're going to talk about hidden treasures. Yeah, I, I want to delve. That's for, I told you, some, for most of you, that is the favorite part of this whole gathering. Hidden treasures. I'm ready. I'm here for those treasures, first of all. When are they coming? Hiya, Kesho, tomorrow we'll be talking about those hidden treasures. But you know, it's interesting because I've come to understand that divine fulfillment is very powerful. Uh, King David, when it says Acts 13, 36, when David had served God's purpose in his generation, he fell asleep, he was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. David served God's purpose in his generation. Let me tell you, money cannot satisfy you like serving God's purpose in your generation. It can't. It can't. I mean, I've had the privilege of hanging out with very wealthy people. And let me tell you, there's nothing that hanging out with wealthy people does to me more than teach me that wealth does not create wealth, uh, pleasure or satisfaction. It doesn't. It's such a lie. It's such a lie. Possessions don't satisfy. <laughs> Do you ever get that thing of, I call it, it's, it's almost like the letdown the day after. You've been saving for a car. You've been saying, one day I'll be seen in that car. And then you get it. It's so nice. You drive it, you're feeling so good. But a month later, you look at that car and then somebody else just flies with another machine. Shua. <laughs> you look at yourself, you say, whoa, it's me. Yeah. And by the way, those days when you used to go by, by Matatu, if someone had shown you the car you currently have, you'd have been saying, God, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Right there in the bus stop. But now it's like, it's, it's just a thing. Possessions don't, nobody. <laughs> you know, one day we were with some pastors from Avuno and we were in Newport Beach and we were on a boat. Yeah, you'll be there. We were on a boat with a friend of ours who had a really nice yacht, eight bedrooms on the, on the, on the boat. Um, and we're just cruising uh, Balboa Island and just going around and being, seeing the sights, seeing where all the billionaires live. And our friend was driving us around. It was his own boat. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm serious friends, by the way. So, so he's driving us around and he's pretty, a pretty wealthy guy. I mean, even to live on that place, you have to be extremely wealthy. And then, as we're just on the, on the boat, another massive boat passed us. Like maybe four times the size of the one we're in. In fact, even the waves kind of pushed us as the boat passed. And I'll never forget, my guy looked and he said, Whoa, that's a boat. <laughs> no. I looked at us, I thought, we all look at you saying, whoa. But you also have someone else you're looking at saying, whoa. When does this thing stop? Whoa is me. <laughs> yeah, I'll never get there. I'll always be looking and thinking, my God. As I'm, as I'm, as I'm watching people going to Jomo Kenyatta Airport to enter a plane, I'm thinking, one day I'll fly. 
Anybody remember that day when you'd say, one day I'll be flying. One day I'll be flying. Ah, then the Lord gave you the, promo the opportunity. And you sat there in the plane. Aha. You're like, if my villagers could see me now. Going to, U uh, going to Amsterdam. Eish. I'm so important. I'm so happy. I have a ticket. I'm even holding. Not somebody's ticket. My ticket. With my name written. Eh? What? And you flew a few more months. And then one day you realized. There's another place you had never seen. <laughs> Business class. Where four of your seats fit one seat of business class. And then you, you walked through business. You know, one day they made a mistake. They upgraded me. And I was flying from, I think I was flying from Dubai to LA. It's a, it's a long flight, 16 hours. And the lady just looked at me and said, sir, just come here a minute. I thought, huh? Is it because I'm black? Why are you asking me to come? You know, the usual thought. And then the lady said, sir, you've just been upgraded. And I got into the plane. First of all, you go in before anybody else, huh? Not with a riffraff. You go in, put your things happily. By the time other people are walking in, already you have your drink. And people, and, and, and that, that plane, they even allow people to pass by you. I was thinking, is, is there someone who knows me? Just to see how business class looks. Hey, take a picture of me, surely. Let me tell you, the problem with that flight, it messed my life. Because now, on the way back from LA, I kept thinking, Lord, can they just upgrade me, please? Why, why, have, why can you not finish what you started? Lord, why would a servant like, like me suffer in economy class? Look at people, have, look at them now, Lord. What, what have I done against you to deserve being in this economy? Remember that economy class that I was praying for? Now it has become a curse to me. Yeah? And then you make the mistake one day. You go, upstairs, you, 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 you go upstairs where you're not supposed to and you see first class. <laughs> Flat beds. Own cabin. They close the door. Huh? Pajamas. Or oh, some of you don't even know such things exist. Imagine the same plane you fly. Pajamas. They have a shower and a bar. You can go and just have a drink anytime in the flight. And a little lounge. You can read magazines. Huh? Personalized chef. Hey, you just say, this business class, Lord, what have I done? What is it that I've not done for you? Have I not served you? Surely. But this is how the human heart, some of you think it's a joke, but this is how the human heart works. Until now you meet a guy who tells you, he flies first class all the time, and then unfortunately one day he opened the window, and he looked outside and he saw a friend getting into a, a jet, a private jet. And he said, who is me? Why am I in a plane with other people? <laughs> yeah. You know, I had a, a, one of my friends who was a pastor. He actually had a private jet. <laughs> and, and, and he goes to conference. And by the way, when you understand the scope of his ministry, he's not boasting. He, he had to go to conferences. He'd be going for back-to-back -back conferences in different nations. He couldn't afford to have this thing of waiting in lines and whatever. So he actually, and the funny thing about it is he didn't even own the jet. One of his members in his church told him, Pastor, whenever you need to fly, I will fly you with my jet. Now you can imagine I'm hearing this in a pastor's conference. I'm wondering, now, Lord. Now, Lord. <laughs> Oh God, let me tell you guys, wealth will never satisfy you. There will always be somebody who is richer, who, is, who has better things than you. And you will always get to a place where you get that law of diminishing returns. The things you thought would give you pleasure, stop giving you pleasure. And your spirit longs for more. And the reason your spirit longs for more is because you are created for more than wealth. You are created for divine fulfillment. Only God can satisfy that longing in your heart. And let me tell you, when you start to serve God, you start to experience that divine fulfillment. You, start, you stop worrying about wealth. Wealth becomes a means to you serving God. And it stops being something that impresses you. Ah, by the way, me, I've, I've, all those things, I've, I've done them. They don't impress me. I've driven cars that I don't even know what they're called. They don't impress me.
neither do I even want to own them. They're even problems. I even feel sorry for the guys who have to worry about all those insurances and things. I'm so glad I can enjoy them and leave them. It's like being a grandparent. You can enjoy the child and leave someone else to take care of it. I'm so glad, by the way. There are limits to what you can enjoy with the things of this world. But divine fulfillment. Tell your neighbor, you will experience divine fulfillment. Yeah. Money can't buy fulfillment. Number four, you will be distinguished. When you serve the Lord, when you choose to become wholehearted in your serving of God, you will be distinguished. There's nobody who served God wholeheartedly who is not distinguished. God will distinguish you. It's interesting, Malachi chapter 3, verse 17 to 18, the same Malachi that talks about tithing. But it says, On the day I act, says the Lord God Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. It's talking about people who serves him. And he says, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. There will be a distinction between those who serve God and those who don't. And that's what the book of Malachi promises us. Let me tell you, God will distinguish you. God will distinguish you. Pastor Milton, God will distinguish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm talking about him because I know he has been distinguished. He's almost the last born in his family. <laughs> But you'd never know going to his family, by the way. He has a voice that is even bigger than a firstborn's. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big house. Yeah. How people get that next year. <laughs> God will distinguish you. When God offers you that, I mean, it's like, it's interesting. Divine authority is such a powerful thing. When you have divine authority, people, you're just distinguished. God, dist God starts to set you up. Yeah, Pastor Madrid, you've served God. Yeah. How many places has God begun to pull you into now just because you're serving him? Yeah. How she's even won an, an Oscar. She's been nominated for an Oscar. Yeah. But the awards that God has for her are way bigger than any earthly awards. The recognition that God has for her will make any earthly things that she receives pale in comparison. Yeah. God is a distinguisher of his servants. And then the last one, and I really like this number five, you will not serve God's enemies. You will not serve God's enemies. You know, serving God is critical because we were all born to serve something or someone. It's just the way we were created. You're created to serve something. None of us was created to serve themselves. You're created to serve something or someone. And the question is, who will you work for? Who will, who will you wake up early and give your best youth and strength to? Who will you spend your time and energy on? What will you die for? Because you know, when God offers you a chance to serve, it's because he knows you are created to serve something. And if you don't serve him, you will still serve something. And that something you will serve is not the good thing to serve. You will serve the enemy of your soul. God will release you to other alternatives if you choose not to serve him. Deuteronomy 28 verse 47 uh, to 48 it says because you did not serve the lord your god joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity therefore in hunger and thirst in nakedness and dire poverty you will serve the enemies the lord sends against you he will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you that's what god told israel aha uh -huh. you don't want to serve me then let me tell you who you will serve you will serve the devil and the devil is not as kind as me yeah it will actually, it will cause you problems. You know, there are many people who are created with amazing gifts to serve God. But because they choose not to, they are now working for the enemy day and night. Building financial kingdoms for unbelievers. Yeah. They have traded their lives. They have given the best of their youth to build wealth for people who don't like love God. Trading their lives to advance the agendas of proud men. And Satan rejoices as God's people are locked down, building monuments to give the enemy glory. Yeah. You've traded your life. You've decided God is not as important. And so God has left you and allowed you to build your life, use your life, selling things that have no value, advancing kingdoms that have no values. You know, we had a friend who worked... Um, and she was a believer, so I think she didn't fit this category. But she worked for a, a soft drink company. And this soft drink company was so rabid with their people. Everybody had to sell. And you, 
like you couldn't consume in your own house you could not consume products from another company like if they came into your house and found even juice from a company another company you would be in trouble and if this person came to your house in fact this person once came to our house and found us serving arrivals soft drinks they were offended this person actually went back to the car and brought a crate of their things and says please can pastor can i remove these things from your house i mean you are taught to be completely passionate to advance the kingdom of selling sugared water that destroys and poisons people's health and you are so passionate about it that you can't even you enter someone's house you're like ah, 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 i can't drink this let me get something like you're so programmed and yes they are paying you good money to do it but what are you trading your life for really that's what you will be remembered for you poisoned a few thousand people's lives and you got a big job in the bargain are you understanding now i've nothing against soft drinks by the way for those of you who work for soft drink companies but you'd better work for that company and let them pay you for advancing a bigger agenda the agenda of the kingdom of god you need to be there understanding i'm here advancing a much there's a friend of mine another friend who was a very high official in the breweries of zambia um and i met him when we went to plant mavuno lusaka and he was a church elder incredible gifted uh man but it was one of those things especially back in the day a bit controversial how do you work for the biggest brewery in the country and i remember just asking him the question how do you ever get that question how do you resolve it and the guy said hey god sent me there because he needs believers in that place he told me the first thing you need to understand in this law there's a law in this land there's a law that you cannot put advertising billboards and any kiosks that sell alcohol near school he says ah uh-uh, that was my job i went there and i lobbied for with my company because they understood it would be dangerous to their sales but they didn't know my agenda was the kingdom agenda i'm saving the future generation of this country he says when they are making decisions i'm in that boardroom because i need to understand what their plan is so i know how to advance kingdom agenda in that place they are paying him but they don't understand their de- agenda they are paying for is a kingdom agenda yeah 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 i'm not saying believers should not be they we they need believers in those places yeah otherwise those places will become horrible but while you're there what are you doing are you just there to make money for them or do you have a much bigger agenda that if, if by the way if they found out they would panic yeah they would panic because they'd be like my god this guy is here to take us down but actually what you're there to do is to advance a much bigger agenda the agenda of the kingdom of god and this is what will happen you will not serve god's enemies when you serve god and you make god your first you will not serve the agenda of god's enemies when you serve god's enemies it's a terrible thing we have another a friend of ours who also owned a a, a big a, a brewery and 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 that was his agenda he gave his life towards that agenda my wife knows who i'm talking about and they had many many uh many many uh very successful they were very successful in their sales but guess what happened these people all their children have died from alcoholic related illnesses yeah so you spread the agenda of evil men and guess what happens you destroy your own family this man this person did not serve god so as a result they served the devil and the devil they say when you eat with the devil eat with a long spoon yeah when you dine with the devil eat with a long spoon because he's bound to grab your hand as you're putting it in that place and the devil will always take a toll on you but listen the bible says in matthew chapter 6 verse 19 do not store up for your treasure yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal yeah don't 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 put your treasures there what do you want to live for what do you want to be known for that you sold many newspapers in your lifetime surely when you're old how will that give you satisfaction i'm glad that you you saw you work in that company but i hope you have a bigger kingdom agenda while you're there that you're able to say by the time i left that company had reached people with the good news by the time i left there were people discipled in that company by the time i left that industry had been regulated for righteousness by the time i left there was less corruption in that place because i had an agenda for the kingdom of god i was representing the kingdom of heaven even though i was being paid by the kingdoms of men amen somebody yeah matthew 6:24 no one can serve two masters we read that either you will hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other Now I want to conclude but I want to say this don't wait till you're older to serve God 
You know those things of when I grow up? You're already grown up. <laughs> News flash. It's now, if you die before serving the Lord, you will have failed in your assignment. You will actually have failed in your assignment. The reason God put you here on earth. And serving the Lord, as we've been talking about at Mavuno, it starts with you being a disciple, isn't it? Because you're here to make disciples of all nations. So that's the first basic step of serving the Lord. And out of that, the Lord is going to grow that and show you what else he created you to, to do. But you are created for eternal impact, every one of us. And let me just say, the Lord has need of the thing he gave you. God gave you your assignment. God gave you your home. God gave you your marriage. God gave you the tribe you're born in. God gave you the village you were brought up in. God gave you the parents he brought you up in. He gave you those circumstances. He gave you the skills. He gave you your ability of thinking. Why? So that he can use it to advance his agenda on this earth. I love the story where the disciples went, were sent by Jesus to look for a donkey. And when they got the donkey in Luke, in Luke 19, 31, Jesus told them, if anyone asks you, why are you losing it? You will say, because the master has need of it. Ah, oh, come on, somebody. The master has need of it. The thing that God has entrusted in you, the master has need of it. Ah, uh -uh, he did not entrust it to you so that you can just hold it to yourself. That career, everything God has given you, it was entrusted in you, to you, and the master has need of it. Come on, tell your neighbor, the master has need of it. Amen.